Remember when Iowa was up four points late in the first half? Mm. Uh, disappointing ending to a great season for the Iowa Hawkeyes. Luca Garza leaving the school as the all-time leading scorer. But the Oregon Ducks keep the Pac-12 perfect with a 95-80 victory despite Luca Garza's 36 points. The key to this game was Iowa not being able to stop Oregon and the Iowa guards being completely exposed in this game. For Oregon... On to the Sweet 16 once again for Dana Altman. They've done it in back-to-back -back tournaments. And look, middle, middle line there. Since the start of the 2015 tournament, seven seeds are now eight and five against two seeds. So here's the updated bracket. Oregon into the Sweet 16, awaiting the winner of USC and Kansas. That is now a pick em. The tip time late tonight. 9.40 Eastern Time. The Oregon Ducks, the first team today to punch their ticket to the Sweet 16. And the Pac-12 becomes the first conference in America to have multiple teams in the Sweet 16. Yesterday it was eight teams, eight different conferences. The day starts off with a Pac-12 upset over the Big Ten. Let's bring in Chip Patterson. Chip, I mean, we knew this was going to be a high-scoring game. I don't think anybody knew that Iowa wasn't going to stop Oregon a single time down the floor. This was a beatdown and really an embarrassment for a number two seed. Yeah, I see this two ways. Number one, your hat goes off to Dana Altman, his staff, and uh, the players. Because as soon as they found out the news about VCU not being able to play in the first round game, they immediately move on to preparing for Iowa. If you throw in a few extra hours, you might not think that's much. But trust me, in the NCAA tournament uh, turnaround, I, I do think that that is very significant. And Dana Altman, uh, I don't know if you knew this, the guy can kind of coach. They saw some opportunities to really expose uh, Iowa in a big way to use a, an Oregon team that doesn't have the kind of size you would think of that to be able to handle Luca Garza. You know, they're they're a group that uh, is long and athletic, but they don't have a lot of uh, players that are taller than six 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 seven, and so. To be able to look at what would be a major disadvantage and use it as an advantage, particularly on the offensive end going up against this Iowa defense, I thought that was a great job. This is not the pace that Oregon normally plays with, but what the Ducks saw was their best path to victory was going to be to try and score as much as possible against this Iowa defense, which brings me to the other side. After we give credit to Oregon, the coaching staff, the game plan, and the way that they wanted to pick apart Iowa, now we've got to look at the Hawkeyes because this has been an issue all season. They can't stop anybody. And it's interesting too, because I actually have them linked to their two seed Big Ten brethren, the Ohio State Buckeyes. What was the issue with the Buckeyes all season. They couldn't stop anybody. And so while the Big Ten gave us a lot of teams that were very impressive, very efficient on offense, those two in particular, uh, it's like we can link them together because yes, they, they left the NCAA tournament earlier than expected based on their seed line. But to me, the reason that they left the tournament is actually a trait that we've seen from both teams throughout the season. Iowa was never really great on defense. They had like a, a four to five game stretch where you wanted to say, hey, maybe this defense has turned a corner. Maybe they're rounding into form uh, come March Madness. But certainly, uh, Iowa at its worst moments, all of that on display against a very versatile Oregon team that just picked them apart. Chip, the, the Pac-12 has been awesome in the tournament that they still haven't lost. But I want to go to the Big Ten because this was a, a conference that was historically, I guess, good in quotes now because we haven't seen anything from the Big Ten in the tournament so far. Some heartbreaking losses, but this was historically supposed to be a great Big Ten season. H how are we so wrong about that? I don't think we were wrong about that, Chris. You, we watched a lot of Big Ten basketball. The games were incredible. The competition was tremendous. The the talent that you could spread out on a table and be able to show um, players that would just take your breath away. And it went, you know, an Io Desumu, a Luca Garza, um, you know, Travion Williams, a, a Purdue team that was really coming on strong late at the end of the season. EJ Liddell at Ohio State. Like we had some of the best players in America, and they gave us some of the best 
regular season games. But, man, in this NCAA tournament, uh, they just haven't had their fastball. Now, I, I do want to link, again, Iowa and Ohio State. Neither of them very good defensively. They were both done in by their defense. I thought that Illinois uh, really just was a, an awful performance for the Fighting Illini at the worst times. But Luca Garza even played so well in this game. Uh, it's almost hard to... It's hard to connect all the Big Ten games and be able to say everything that we saw in the regular season didn't happen. I will not do that because I saw everything Luca Garza did this year. I saw everything Ayo Desumu did this year, Kofi Coburn. Uh, I just believe that what we have seen from the Big Ten is just a, a connected series of mostly random events. But in the case of the Iowa Hawkeyes, not that random because the one thing that they've been poor at all year uh, was ultimately the thing that ended their season. A record nine Big Ten teams entered the tournament. Only two remain later on today, Maryland and top-seeded Michigan. And I know a lot of people are picking LSU for the upset in that one. Uh, when you look at this game in particular, you mentioned Dana Altman and the way he can coach. We knew he was a great coach. What were some of the key ways in which he outcoached Fran McCaffrey? I think it had to do with, number one, looking at how Iowa played uh, on-ball defense and the ways that they could do it. Number one was with the pick and roll. Number two with ball movement where they had really poor rotation. Um, you know, you're not always going to get the kind of lights out three-point shooting that you got from LJ Figueroa, for example. Uh, Will Richardson came up with a couple huge threes. But I do think that even outside of the hot three-point shooting, there was just a lot of times where Iowa was caught out of position where they couldn't stay in front of they couldn't stay in front on defense the pick and roll coverage was bad and and that goes back to an interesting part of the Luca Garza discussion which is you know why is someone who has one of the most decorated college careers uh, ever why are they not uh, a top 5 or top 10 pick and it's because you can pick apart a team that has Luca Garza on, on the floor defensively because he's just not going to be able to come out and guard in the same way that some of the more versatile big men are, the ones that are really prioritized at the next level. So uh, just disappointing to see Iowa, a team that still sh like shot the ball pretty well in this game. It's just they couldn't get any stops. And um, man, tough, tough end for Luca Garza, who I hope, you know, there's almost for me some comfort in the fact that Luca goes out putting up 36 on an, a very efficient day because it was all of his individual brilliance while at the same time uh, being on a team that was very much showcasing the reason why the Hawkeyes have not been able to make it uh, to the second weekend of the NCAA tournament. Yeah, he was one of the few, maybe even the only Iowa player that was fighting until the very end. He'll be remembered as the greatest Hawkeye basketball player of all time, no question about it. So if you're Oregon, you're moving on now. I mean, you had that crazy... Uh, first round where you didn't even play, you just advanced because of VCU's COVID issues. You come out, you look like this, and now you await the winner of, of USC, fellow Pac-12 team, and Kansas. Which team do they match up better against? I'm going to say Kansas just because of the unknown, but I think USC is a good matchup as well. You know, USC struggled against Oregon in some of their head-to-head -head matchups. And so I think that Kansas, maybe because uh, the scouting report that Kansas would put together on Oregon would not be as deep as what Andy Enfield could do. And of course, when we look down low, Evan Mobley, uh, seven-foot center, one of the best players in the entire country, there is a size disadvantage. If the Trojans get another look at the Ducks, that might be something that they can expose. So I will say Kansas, a shorthanded Kansas team. But Chris, the, the big conversation for me is that Oregon's not afraid of either one of these teams. Oregon can beat Kansas. Oregon can beat USC. And that means that the Ducks should be going into the Sweet 16, into that Sunday matchup, believing that they can show up on a floor against Gonzaga and get one crack at their Pacific Northwest uh, foe in the Bulldogs. I, I would favor Gonzaga. I would pick Gonzaga in that matchup. But Oregon against either USC or Kansas is a matchup that the Ducks, especially after this performance, should feel like they can win. Uh, Oregon did play at USC earlier on this season. It was February the 22nd, and uh, Oregon lost 72 to 58. So they may be looking at uh, a little revenge. Uh, if they get that matchup in the Sweet 16. Chip Patterson here on CBS Sports HQ. Uh, you can check out the Ion College Basketball podcast from CBS Sports. Matt Norlander and Gary Parrish keeping you up to date as the tournament moves along.
Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.